Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. I was recently taking my son to college at the Master's University in Southern California. And as we drove out there, we had plans to make several stops along the way to do some dirt biking. We had an agenda, we had a timeline, and to help us get to where we were going, we used my phone's messaging app to guide us. It was a great time, and and I'm reminded of it today as we study Daniel 9, which lays out God's agenda and His timeline for the ages. And so, welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. Today, we are diving into Daniel chapter 9, which is an amazing and important chapter which helps us understand God's plans for what's to come. Now, if you've already read this chapter, then I'd like to ask for permission to group the first 19 verses under a couple summary comments. We've just got to save some time because we're going to be focusing on verses 24 to 27 in today's episode. And so if you've read Daniel chapter 9, this chapter starts out with a long prayer of repentance from Daniel. It's a great prayer filled with wonderful truths and rich examples of how we can seek our Lord even today. Daniel's prayer is on behalf of the Jews because Daniel knows from the book of Jeremiah that the time of the exile will be coming to an end soon. And so this prayer calls upon the Lord for forgiveness and to remember his covenants with his people. Now, although this is a great prayer, here's just again, here's just a couple brief comments. For one thing, in verse 2, Daniel tells us that he was studying the book of Jeremiah and he sees Jeremiah's prophecy where the Lord said that their exile would last for 70 years. Now, we find these prophecies in Jeremiah 25, 11, and 12, and in Jeremiah 29, 10. And if you want to hear more about how those dates and all that timing works, we talked about this in those podcasts on those chapters, specifically in Jeremiah 29. Now, the point is that Daniel's been living in captivity since 605 BC, and he knows that they're coming to the end of this 70-year sentence from God. Now, going on to verse 3, notice the manner in which Daniel prays. He prays with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. This is reminiscent of our study of true fasting in Isaiah 58, where the goal of fasting isn't to starve ourselves of something that we really like to draw out God's sympathies. Instead, fasting is intending to set aside every priority and distraction so that we might focus totally on the Lord and submitting to His will. In fact, in verse 21, Daniel says at the end of all of this praying, he was extremely weary. That shows us the total focus and devotion of this kind of prayer. This is wrestling with God. This is spending serious time with Him. This prayer is to the point of exhaustion, which isn't a bad goal for us to have when we're seeking the kind of obedience that Daniel's pursuing here. And along these lines, the phrase sackcloth and ashes speaks to the ancient principle of demonstrating physically the grief and repentance we feel over our sins. And so Daniel is praying and fasting in verse 3 to praise God as the one who keeps his covenant in verse 4 and who will grant grace and mercy and forgiveness to his people, which is then outlined in the rest of this chapter. Now again, so much more can be said about this model prayer, but that's the gist of it. If we're ever struggling with sin, this prayer is a great example for us to follow as we seek the Lord to the point of exhaustion as we call upon him in repentance and just seeking his forgiveness. Going on, the end of Daniel's prayer brings us now to verses 20 to 23, where Daniel's extremely weary, as it says in verse 21, and the angel Gabriel comes to him. Now, Gabriel is also the angel who explained the vision of the rams and goats to Daniel yesterday in chapter 8. And so in verse 22, Gabriel says that he has visited Daniel to give him further insights and understanding into what is to come. And so Gabriel tells Daniel in verse 24, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. And that's just a fantastic summary of God's agenda for the ages. Let's start with the very first words here in verse 24. In verse 24, Gabriel tells Daniel about the 70 weeks. And now at this point in our study of the book of Daniel, we are getting accustomed to marking time with sevens. Back in chapter 4, we saw in verses 16, 23, 25, and 32, that Nebuchadnezzar was prophesied to be mentally incapacitated for seven periods of time. And we explained that this was a key verse because it is the first of several examples of God's divine calendar system. Now, when we look at the sevens here in verse 24, we need to know that the word weak is not in the original Hebrew. It's been added by the translators, and and I think it actually may make this more confusing. The Hebrew is literally 70 sevens, as in not the number 77, but 70 units of seven. And so Gabriel is actually saying 
Seventy units of seven have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression. So what is Gabriel talking about with these seventy groups of sevens? Well, it's pretty common for people to suggest that these groups represent years, as in seventy groups of seven years. And here's how they come to this conclusion. For one thing, the idea of equating a day with a year is used in other places in the Bible. For instance, in the book of Ezekiel that was written roughly around the same time, in Ezekiel 4.6, the Lord has Ezekiel lie on his side for a set number of days, and the Lord specifically says that each day represents a year. Likewise, all the way back in Leviticus 25.8, there's a similar use of the word sevens. Now, I'm going to read Leviticus 25.8 and, and try to listen for the use of the word seven with the idea of years. Leviticus 25.8 says, You are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years, so that you have the time of the seven Sabbaths of years, namely 49 years. And so, in light of these examples, I think it's safe to say that Daniel 9.24 is referring to years, specifically 70 periods of seven years. So, let's take this idea and unpack what these 70 periods of seven years are talking about. Going back to verse 24, Gabriel tells us that these have been decreed. Now, the Hebrew word for decreed means to cut out. And so these 70 periods of seven years have been specifically carved out of human history to accomplish God's divine agenda. Now, what is this agenda? Well, verse 24 says that that this agenda is to finish transgressions, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, that's a pretty significant agenda. Now, what does all this mean? Well, finishing transgression is speaking about bringing an end to Israel's waywardness in regards to their covenant with him. Uh, Making an end of sin and making atonement for iniquity speaks of a time when people will no longer have sin on their record. Hebrews 9.26 says that Jesus put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And that just speaks of how he has cleansed our sinful record by imputing his righteousness to our account. Now, the phrase bringing in everlasting righteousness, that's speaking about ushering in the divine righteousness of Christ that is given for all his people and its impact on their lives as they now live by the righteousness they have in Christ. Uh, To seal up vision and prophecy, that's speaking about bringing an end to the time when God has to communicate through the less direct means of vision and prophecy. The phrase to anoint the most holy place That's speaking of when Christ brings his own blood into the heavenly tabernacle to make an atonement for our sins, and that was also given an in-depth treatment in Hebrews 9. Now, as followers of Jesus, we might be tempted to think that this whole agenda was accomplished in Christ's first coming, but they weren't. Israel has not finished rebelling against her covenant with the Lord. And although everlasting righteousness has been brought in and eternal atonement has been made, Our slavery to sin has not yet come to an end. Likewise, we've also not seen a sealing up of vision and prophecy. I'm not suggesting that we still have prophets running around like in biblical days. But in the end times, Revelation 11 tells us that prophets will return. And so the days without the need for visions and prophecy is still yet to come. And so the agenda of verse 24 has only been partially completed. And yet the timeline that Gabriel gives us actually allows for this delay. And we'll see this as we keep working through this passage. So let's go on to verse 25. Verse 25 says, So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It, that's Jerusalem there, it will be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. And so this verse here might be as clear as mud, But I think you'll find it actually makes perfect sense as we unpack it. Now, remember the intent of this passage here. Gabriel wants Daniel, and by extension all of us, to know and discern what is being spoken about here. And so even though there is some debate about the particulars, the overall point is straightforward. Gabriel is giving us the timeline for when these events will happen. And so verse 25 is saying that the Messiah will come after the combined time that is equivalent to seven periods of sevens and 62 more periods of sevens for a total of 69 periods of sevens. Now, as we mentioned a moment ago, these sevens are talking about years. So if one week equals seven years, then the first set of sevens in verse 25, that equals 49 years. And if we use the same math on the next set of 62 sevens, that works out to being 434 years. And we combine those groupings together, 
we get a total of 483 years. And so what happens in 483 years? That's when, verse 25 tells us, that's when the Messiah will arrive on the scene. Okay, so now let's take these 483 years and figure out when these prophesied events actually occurred in history. Now, different people are going to add up these dates differently, but here's roughly how an old scholar named Sir Robert Anderson calculated these dates back in 1881. If you look back at verse 25, it actually gives us the event that starts the stopwatch of the 483 years of this calendar. And so verse 25 says again, So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, it, Jerusalem, will be built again. And so this clock of 483 years starts ticking when the decree is issued to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, when did that occur? Well, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you'll remember from the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, both of which were written after this prophecy, And both books contain several decrees that might relate to what this is talking about. But only one decree actually satisfies what verse 25 is addressing. And that's when the Persian king Artaxerxes decreed for Nehemiah to return to Jerusalem in 445 BC to rebuild the walls. And so more than likely, Artaxerxes' command to Nehemiah is the event that kicks off this timeline. One more thing to quickly point out here. If you look at verse 25, in the NES translation, it talks about building a plaza and a moat. And we might be wondering, where was this moat built? Well, the word moat there, it's kind of an unfortunate translation because we think of a castle with like some water around it or something like that. But the Hebrew word that's used here describes something that has been cut. And if you think about cutting dirt, you're probably digging a trench into the ground, which is how several Bible versions do translate this word in verse 25. They they translate it as trench. When we think about why you would dig a trench around a city, you would probably be doing it for defensive purposes, which is why the NLT translation renders this as strong defenses. And so that's probably what's being talked about here in verse 25. Now, when did all of that occur? Well, again, this entire process of building and establishing defenses around Jerusalem didn't occur until Nehemiah rebuilt the walls, which brought safety and rest to the city. And so going back to the prophetic clock for when this happened, Artaxerxes' decree there, when did that happen? That's generally understood to have happened on March 14th, 445 BC. And so the Messiah was going to come 483 years after March 14th, 445 BC. But now we got to pause for a moment and explain how ancient calendars worked. And for what it's worth, I think that the challenges that we're going to be talking about here are probably why the angel Gabriel doesn't use the word for years, because what is a year? Well, the ancients had different ideas about years. The Jews, the Babylonians, the Persians, they all had different numbers of days in a year. And the Jewish calendar had 360 days. And so if we figure out how many days of 360-day years are in 483 years, we get 173,880 days. And so, what happens 173,880 days after March 14th, 445 BC? Well, different scholars have different theories, but the way that seems most accurate to me brings us to the 10th of Nisan, 30 AD, Nisan being a month, a Jewish way of using months. And what happened on the 10th of Nisan in 30 AD? That was Palm Sunday. That was the day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem before massive crowds that were cheering the arrival of their king. And that that is just amazing. And unless this seems too good to be true, remember how the crowds are just so joyously celebrating Jesus' arrival? I'd imagine that they were doing all this same math too and seeing that was the day the Messiah was expected to arrive. Amazing stuff here. Amazing prophecies here. And so, although this is mind-blowing in its specificity, we still have more prophecies to go in this passage. So, let's go now on to verse 26. Verse 26 says, Then, after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Now, now what? The Messiah will arrive and then be cut off? Does it really say that? Yes, it does. And that's exactly what happened when the people crucified Jesus. And so, that's already occurred too. Well, then what comes next? Well, verse 26 goes on to say, And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, has that already happened? That's happened as well. Well, when did this happen? Who did this? Well, we need to know that the prince in verse 26 is not the Messiah of verse 25. This is referring to the Roman general named Titus who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. Now, Titus wasn't the emperor at the time, 
but he would be. And so, indeed, a prince did come and destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD, which is fairly soon after the Messiah was cut off. And then the flood and the war and the desolations at the end of verse 26, that's all speaking of the total turmoil that the Jews experienced afterwards. And so, for a quick summary, the angel Gabriel is telling Daniel that there are major spiritual victories that will one day occur. They'll start when the Messiah first arrives, but he'll be cut off and there'll be a pause in this timeline. And so now, what's going on now? Where do we fit in this timeline? Well, we fit into a gap that's between verses 26 and 27. We don't know how long this gap will last, but verse 27 tells us that when this gap ends, that will begin a final period of seven years that we call the tribulation. And now, if this seems a bit confusing, you're not alone. This is one of those mountain range prophecies that we spoke about yesterday, where the prophecy is describing two events as though they are one. And so, verse 26 is speaking about the time when the first Roman Empire destroys Jerusalem. And then in verse 27, it's speaking about the revised Roman Empire that was illustrated by the feet of the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which had the iron and clay toes back in Daniel 2, 42. Uh, Verse 27 is also speaking about the prophecy of the fourth beast in Daniel 7, when the revised Roman Empire will return with ten kings who will bow down to the eleventh. And so at some point in the future, this 11th king, who is the prince of verse 27, will be the person we call the Antichrist. And we saw in our studies of Ezekiel 40 to 48 that at this point in time, some kind of Jerusalem temple will have been rebuilt. And so in verse 27, it tells us that the Antichrist will make a firm covenant of peace and safety for seven years. But halfway through the seven years, which is again the time, times, and half a time that we read about in chapter 7, verse 25, Halfway through those seven years, he's going to put a stop to sacrifice and worship. And we saw that this was foretold in Daniel 7.25, when the Antichrist will seek to change the days of worship and the regulations of the religious laws of the Jewish people. Or, like in chapter 8, verse 12, he will end the regular sacrifices and and, and fling truth to the ground. So again, here we see this. And, And in chapter 9, verse 27, here... Gabriel describes this work as a wing of abomination that brings the desolation on the earth. Not good stuff. But verse 27 promises that it has been decreed that this Antichrist himself will not endure and he will face a complete destruction at the end of the final period of seven years. And that will then usher in the messianic age, which we read about in chapters 2, 7, and 8, and now again here in chapter 9. And so finally, when all this happens, The agenda that we saw back in verse 24 at the beginning of our podcast, that's going to be fulfilled. The children of Israel will no longer be rebelling against their covenant with the Lord. All of God's people will be fully atoned by the blood of Christ. The Lord will usher in a time of everlasting righteousness because people are no longer enslaved to sin. We will no longer need vision or prophecy because we'll all be in the kingdom with the Messiah. And we'll enjoy devoted worship before the Lord forever. And all of this will be fulfilled in the messianic kingdom, which is finally and fully established in the millennial age, which then wraps up Daniel 9. Now, I know this has been a lot, but hopefully you can see how amazing this prophecy is. What a gift from God to us. This passage continues to prove to us that we need to take these matters seriously and continue to look to God to fulfill his agenda and his timeline. These are God's words to us. It's possible that these events are not far off in the future. Again, if you think about it, the children of Israel were restored to their land in 1948. The modern nation of Israel continues to be a center of so much news. So these days may not be far off, and we need to know what is coming so we can be prepared. We need to be people of the Messiah so that when he returns, we'll be among those whom he gathers to himself. So we'll end things there. Hope you have a great rest of your day as you think about all these things. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless.